Extra time. Hello and welcome back to the Extra Time podcast. It's me, your host, one of your hosts, Patrick Van Straten. I'm back from paternity leave Ooh, and I'm joined by on. the dream team, Sam Abbasaki. Hello, Sam. Yes, yes, bro. How are you doing, man? It's good to be on a podcast with you again. Yeah, it is. It's good. I'm, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad that we've got a strong lineup. Didn't want to have to do this with, you know, some of the weaker members of the team. We know who they are. <laughs> Joe Tomlinson, you're joining us too. How are you, Joe? <laughs> Yeah, mate, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm not going to lie. My five-a-side team got dumped 16-1 last night. Um, cool. So I'm still reeling off the back of that. If you want to know how that happened, don't ask me because I think after about the fourth goal, I blacked out. It was honestly like, a humiliation. <laughs> honestly, no, I was at, actually... least, at least you gave your all until the very end, didn't it? You didn't quit at halftime because you said it was 8-0. You know, you, you, you carried on and that's all that matters. It's the heart that you, that you showed in it. No offense. I've Sam, never seen anything like it, though. I can't believe you're saying that, Sam. Like, because this is the thing. I, <laughs> I, I, I saw in the WhatsApp chat, like the Football Daily chat, when they were talking about, you know, the Arsenal under 23s defending in that West Ham game. And you were like, how can they be defending like this? And I was like, Sam, I've played five aside with you. This is exactly how you defend in, in five aside. You like don't swing a leg that. out. You don't swing a leg out. Do that, Pat. If you don't get that there, you're like, true. my meniscus is gone. I'm just going to have a big sit down. <laughs> I, I have changed. This is a new year. Ask Joe. I've not been injured all year. Like since the turn of twenty twenty one. I literally asked you to play five aside three times. You said no because you weren't fit enough. And you were bro, injured. you lost sixteen one. Do you think <laughs> I can do that to myself? I can't do that to myself. I knew what was coming. Well, yeah, I you're a I think we've won now. one game. Exactly. So. Exactly. I'm a champ. Champ. <laughs> <laughs> we can't can't lower yourself to play with like Joe and Temps and Sonny. Okay, well it's good it's good to know that you're already big footing us. Um, right, let's move on then. Shall we talk about the podcast? Because today I figured that we could do a little bit of over under uh, for the season ahead. So basically, I'm going to give you a kind of betting line, and I want you to say whether you're more optimistic or less optimistic. It'll make sense as we go. So I figure this okay. is going to be a good way to talk about some of the bigger stories around European football right now. So, let's start at Arsenal, where there's always controversy. Oh, Arsenal fans yes. already in meltdown after one game of oh. the season. An away loss apparently is now unacceptable to Arsenal fans. And if that's the case, it's going to be a very long year. Um, I was looking up some odds for uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang this season. And I found that he is 33-1 to 1 to be top scorer in the Premier League, which I think you know, maybe worth a flutter if he stays. No. Bag just 10 in the league last year, linked with a move to Barcelona this week. So I'm going to put the over under on goals he scores in the Premier League this season at 12 goals. So, Ooh. Joe, you seem to have a very Ooh. strong opinion. Do you think he'll get Ooh. more or fewer than 12 league goals? Well, he's definitely not going to be top scorer. It's just not going to happen, okay. especially now Romelu Lukaku's joined the league. And when Harry Kane event eventually goes to Manchester City, it's going to be a bloodbath. So he's not going to be top scorer, but... I will take over on 12 goals. I think it might be around the sort of 12 or 13 mark that Aubameyang hits this season. Uh, you've got to remember that last year, I think it was 10 league goals, wasn't it? Against expected goals of like 10 or 11 as well. And that was six months of the season without Emil Smith-Rowe. Hmm. So I think Emil Smith-Rowe's added creativity. Martin Odegaard obviously coming into the side adds extra creativity in those pockets. Saka's a year older. I do think... I'm much more positive about Arsenal than Arsenal fans. Mm. Like, I had them fifth in my predictions. I think they're going to be around that fifth, sixth spot. They were the third best team in the Premier League for the second half of the season, in my opinion. I think Arsenal are going to be fine. And some of the reactionary statements online have been... It's almost comical now. Like, it's such disarray at Arsenal amongst mm. the fan base that whatever happens, people are kicking off. Like the Martin yeah. Odegaard signing for £30 million, a 22-year-old coming out of Madrid with extremely high creative numbers that's only going to improve. People are somehow finding a problem with that signing, despite the fact Arsenal needed exactly a player like Martin Odegaard. I think it's totally bizarre, and it's almost now like shiny new toy syndrome. If it's mm. not a brand new face that's uh, going to come in and really light up the room like James Madison, and they don't want anything at all. So you're not going to get James Madison. He's too expensive. Martin Odegaard is a fantastic move. I think Arsenal fans need to relax, man. I mean, I don't know. no one's going to disagree with that. I don't Sam, know. Will, I Sam Will, I Sam Will. Sam will find a way of the, disagreeing with me. The, the reason I disagree, yeah, oh, is God. because 
the, the energy around Arsenal has been toxic for years. We know this. We've seen them year after year. This is what I think the second or third year that they've they finished outside of the top six. Yeah, so like if you're an eight Arsenal twice fan, in a row, yeah, eight twice in a row. That's that's not good. And when you're going into like a summer transfer window, I know, like you said, Odegaard. I think Odegaard is a good signing, but at the same time. You've seen Ode- Odegaard's going to come through the door. You're seeing Ben White come through the door, a man that's only had over 30 plus appearances in the Premier League year. Yeah? You're seeing teams around you sign Lukaku, Kane's linked with City, um, Sancho and Varane's going to United. Liverpool are getting back players that they've missed, and they also signed another promising centre back. Like, as an Arsenal fan, you're going to look around and you're going to think, like, lads, what's going on? <laughs> like, are we not going to sign anyone that gives us, like, that hope? Because, obviously, we saw Odegaard last season. He didn't have the best time at Arsenal. We know that he's definitely got more to give. But at the same time, I feel like they need that one signing that gets the fans, like, up like and gets them feeling, OK, cool, we can not maybe challenge for the title, but we can challenge for top four or European spots. And I just don't think they've done that yet, man. But I think that that's a, pro- that's a problem of, like, stuff they've done in the past. So I think like, I agree that if I were Arsenal, what I would want to do is get one game-changing attacking signing. I think for all Mm. the problems people talk about in midfield and in defence, I think the defence will probably be okay. Like, I think midfield, like, do I like Xhaka being there? No, but Xhaka party was perfectly serviceable back half of last season. The thing that gets you points is having an elite attacker. But when you've put so much money into Aubameyang and Willian's contract and you're kind of stuck then you block your path to make that sort of signing. So I agree that like mm. maybe it would be better off it would be better off if they they went and got like that game changing attacker, but I'm not sure that game changing attacker is one available this summer, two mm. available to Arsenal, um yeah. or three doable with the finances they've got. I think it might have to be next year when Lacazette leaves if he doesn't go this summer. Uh, when Aubameyang is like maybe a year older, you can then kind of talk about shifting him out. I think William will go at some point. Like right now, I think it's really hard to find the space in the squad. And so I think a 22-year-old Odegaard, who I thought was really good last season, and certainly, like you say, has a lot more to give, is probably a sensible move. And what I don't understand is Arsenal fans turning their noses up at players who are better than our team currently is. Exactly. That's yeah. exact, exactly what I was yeah. going to say. Like, look at the that. team that Arsenal had to put out against Brentford and tell me Erdegaard would not be an improvement yeah. in some area of that side. He absolutely would improve that side. And I think, mm. to come back to your point, Sam, about comparing them to, you know, City and Chelsea, United, Liverpool, I think Arsenal have got to be a little bit more realistic mm amongst who they're contending for that battle with. I think the realistic push for Arsenal is to try and finish fifth at best this season. Mm. And to finish fifth, you're competing with Leicester and Tottenham potentially. I think that you can have as good a summer as Tottenham without signing a superstar or a megastar. You can have as good a summer as Leicester without signing a megastar. Leicester have proven that with smart, small recruitment, that they can improve gradually over time. And I think it's totally unrealistic to imagine one player, even a superstar coming in and saying that it's going to lift Arsenal to being Premier League title contenders. Oh yeah, definitely not. They've got to be smart and recruit slightly younger, like they're doing with Erdegaard and Ben White and Lakonga, and say that that pushes them from fifth, and then those players develop a year older, and then you can start bringing in a player like James Madison, potentially, or Mm. a a striker that's going to be a bit more... uh, all round, I would say, let's say Lautaro Martinez or something didn't sign that contract and came in when they finished fifth, that takes him to... Like, it's got to be a gradual process. Arsenal have tried to sign tall bust players for the last three years yes. where, in the hope that they're going to win a title in the mm. next four and it's not worked once. I think they've got to play the long game. I don't even think Madison is really better than Odegaard. Like, I don't. Like, I mean, I, I like... No, but I he think has more of an immediate prim, impact, prim prim he? he? would have prim more prim of an immediate impact yeah. than, well, than Erdogan. If he's fit, we hope so. But his season last year, even when he was fit, wasn't that great. He's never really had numbers better than Odegaard. Like, I like that I think he's... I think he's an above average shooter from range and I do think he's mm. capable of being better than he was last season. But even if you look at his numbers from the season before, they're not all that and they're certainly not twice as much money as Odegaard good. Like, I think if you... I... I I suppose the missed opportunity for me was less like someone like Madison and more somebody like Buendia, who I think could play a variety of positions. Like Odegaard, mm. he can play off the right, but he's really a number 10. Madison is a number 10. 
Like the good thing about Buendia is you could play him as a number 10 or as a straight up winger. And I think that that's a flexibility you'd like. But given the price limit, like it looks like we're going to get Odegaard for for less than Villa paid for Buendia. And I, I think, mm, mm. okay, well, that, that's kind of all right. But to go, to go back to the thing about Aubameyang. Yeah. I thought he was kind of finished over the first half of last season. But now I'm actually reasonably bullish about his goal scoring chances this year if he gets on the pitch. Um, that's what I'm saying. You know, say. because like after Christmas... Before Christmas, he was taking 1.9 shots a game and 0.3 XG per game, which is basically finished. After Christmas, it was 2.5 shots, but it was 0.7 XG a game, which is like a world-class number. And I was like, mm. this is still not a great Arsenal side. Like, So he was putting numbers up when he went to centre forward in the 4-2-3-1. And I think even if he drops down from that a little bit this season he's probably likely to get more than 12 goals. Like, I think I think betting on him to get 15-16 is perfectly reasonable um, because Arsenal are going to be more creative this season than they've been in the couple of years before it. Um, so, mm. I don't know. I'm I, If he stays on the pitch, I'm actually quite bullish about him, which is not to say I think, oh, Arsenal are great. This is not just me being like an Arsenal fan. Um, I don't think... I, I think if we should probably sell Aubameyang if we can. But I don't like, know. I don't you know. were right on the contract as well. So, pat on the back, FC... Uh, Van Straten, because that was <laughs> a big shout, mate. Yeah, I've, I've got to disagree with you lot, though. I think it's uh, it's it might not be under. Yeah, he, he might just hit twelve league goals in it because last season, yeah. let's be realistic, he only scored ten goals, two were penalties. This season, we've seen he missed a game against Brentford because of sickness. Yeah, he's missing. <laughs> yeah. He's probably going to miss a game against. You know, <laughs> you know, what I mean? he's he's probably going to miss a game against Chelsea as well. And this is your club captain. Do you know what I mean? Like. That's mm. that type of energy that it, it puts throughout the team, the fans, is not a good look. And also, this year we've got the African Cup of Nations. Yeah. He's going to miss a, a majority of the season with that. And Arteta doesn't even seem to... He's not like, going to miss a majority whenever... of the season. He plays for Gabon. Not majority, He's but... going to miss like two games. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to the final but of he, AFCON, Sam. But, but, but even, even at that, he's going to be away from the squad again. Do you yes. get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's like he's going to have these inconsistencies in the squad. And it's just not a good look. And you... You can kind of tell when Arteta talks about him, it's not like positive. You never hear no. him saying stuff that is like, yeah, my captain, don't worry. He's going to be back next week. He's going to lead the lads. It's always like, he's all right. Or he's <laughs> he, he's going to be back in a few weeks. Or we don't really... And it's just that that type of energy, I just don't think is is something that we're used to with Aubameyang, especially before he signed his contract. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And I guess he still does like, from his interview, he said he wants to be an Arsenal legend. He wants to have a... He wants to be an icon for the club. But since he signed the contract, I haven't seen anything in terms of the way he plays and the ter in terms of the way he like works for the team. Obviously, with the signing of Ben White, you're going to you're gonna play a bit different. And I don't know if Arteta really sees Aubameyang as that striker that can play in that system. That's why mm. there's been rumours of him, of, of him going to Barcelona with that swap deal with Coutinho and... And him not being in the team, so it's strange, man. I don't know. I think he could, he could get just under twelve goals. I think you're right I and wrong there. Like I think Abamyang, I think if Abamyang's at the club, Arteta will play him. But I do think that when Arteta looks for a new striker, I think he's looking for a better version of Lacazette rather than a better version of Abamyang. Mm. I think he wants that guy who links play, who defends really high. I mean, just to play devil's advocate on this. I agree that with all the missing games and stuff, I agree with potentially, you know, if Arsenal are pressing more and stuff, then maybe Aubameyang's not the right guy. But also, you think how bad Autumn was last year. I think it's unlikely to be quite that bad again. And also, he mm. did have malaria last season. It wasn't like he was there true, like every true. game. So, I mean, you could argue even if he misses AFCON, if he comes back fit, it's better than coming back with malaria. Mm. I do think but that striker situation is a problem though for Arsenal yes, like definitely. a problem that's going under the radar quite badly as well and Erdegaard obviously fills a bit of that creative void that we've spoken about all summer but I watched Balogun in that Brentford game he's clearly he not ready bullied. for he senior starts mm. at a like, consistent basis um, a la maybe like a Mason Greenwood I don't think he's physically developed enough to do that I think he might have an impact off the bench and he might um, start to grow into the side that way but throwing him in the deep end let's say next Saturday or is it Sunday whenever it is against Chelsea and saying Balogun you're going to be up front against Chelsea's back three I think is is just next stupid to be honest mm. with you Martinelli 
obviously is not going to be played through the middle at this stage. If if Arteta liked Martinelli through the middle, we would have seen him line up through the middle, I think, against Brentford, to be honest with you. And he would have tried to utilise somebody else wide. And Lacazette and Aubameyang, transferitis, Lacazette's got one year left on his contract. I think that that is the area they, they really could have done with focusing in on th- this mm. summer, especially with a player like Tammy Abraham available on the market. Might not have been perfect for Arsenal's new system, but at least it would have been another young player coming into the club that could improve and Arteta could mould to the player he wants to be. Mm. Because Lacazette and Aubameyang feel like they're leaving. Balogun feels slightly too raw. Martin he feels like he's going to play on the left. I feel like there's a big void developing up front for Arsenal I, well yeah but I just I think this is again like what we're talking about with just like terrible transfer business terrible contracts like the planet I think they just can't sell anyone well yeah you and I mean there, there, are, there are Arsenal fans who complain about Lacazette and Aubameyang over the last couple of years as if it was a problem that we had like two decent strikers um, the problem wasn't that the problem was like the utter lack of depth in the rest of attack but now when we when we've given Aubameyang this big contract and we can't shift Lacquer out because of Covid suddenly we're in an issue we're in a state where we that position is blocked and it's going to be really hard to like bring somebody in at that position I mean I think that Martinelli probably the one of the best case scenarios for Arsenal season is that Martinelli explodes and I do think that Martinelli I'd put him on the same level as guys like Saka and Greenwood like I really I think he's I think he's that good like I think it's entirely possible. I think he genuinely might be our best attacker. Like, if he's fit, he just plays a bunch of games. just free as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, he exactly. Needs to stay injury fit. Yeah, which is a big part of his development. But, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Arsenal are just, uh, just bad at planning. And I completely agree that Arteta makes these weird decisions. Like, he's... I don't know. I think he's a... Uh, He's one of those people who played in the Prem during like the Ferguson era. And I wonder if mm. he's articulated a lot of the bad... He, if he's... Um, absorbed a lot of the bad stuff from from ferguson which is just like mm. i will be like really harsh and really like blunt and he hasn't really realized that like you need to understand it's when that's a good work. idea and when it's a bad it's, idea yeah it hasn't worked with arsenal and like don't get it twisted losing to brentford on the first day of the season it's like it's bad but it's not the worst thing like i think there was only a few teams that played um a way that actually won in the, fir- in, in yeah. the first game. So mm. that's not the worst case, but it's just the fact that coming from that now, you're st- you're still saying that Laka and Aubameyang are unlikely to play against Chelsea. You've signed Odegaard. Fans are 50-50 on him. There's few rumours that you're going to sign Alwa because he's, I think he's taken a real stand and telling me on that. I just, just let me go. So I think that, that could be, that could also be a decent signing for Arsenal as well. But in terms of that front area, I think... You, if you don't, if you don't get at least one of them on board, like fully arm round Aubameyang, arm round Lacazette, and say, lads, I need you, like I need mm. you to 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 lift the team because they are senior players. I need you to lift the team, to lift the fans, so we can actually look like, at least look like, we're trying to do something this season. Then, then I don't know what can happen if that don't happen. Yeah, agreed. Well, you're taking the under or the dead on, which I think is a bit of a cop out. Joe and I, I think, are taking the marginally over yeah. on this. Um, so shall we move on to a club, one of the very, very few clubs in football who make Arsenal look reasonably competent. We're moving on to Barcelona. Now, Barcelona, I've decided to ballpark this at Barcelona will finish third, which I think wow. is like kind of... Kind. Interesting. Okay. Right. So, Joe, I'm going to assume you're taking the under <laughs> on Barcelona. No, I'm taking the over. I think, I think, that's, I think they'll comfortably finish... Over the third spot, like I really? think you could have had it second. As like, are they going to win it as the over and under? That was my sort of exasperation. I Whoa. think that even without Lionel Messi, um, they are still going to do some serious damage to mm. La Liga this season. Obviously, La- Lionel Messi's thirty-nine goal contributions aren't going to be covered by Memphis Depay alone, but I think he will be a significant upgrade on some of the other players that are left in that squad. Alain Martin Braithwaite. Oh my god! Um, I think Barcelona. To be honest with you, I know Atletico Madrid won the league last year. I still think Barcelona are probably the best side in the league. Um, yes. Th- and they did fall short. I understand that. I do think they're probably the second best team in the league at the moment, to be honest with you. Real Madrid have also had, so far, a really poor summer, in my opinion. I don't think they've done nearly enough. If they get Mbappe, that changes. But they are playing a tour bus game with Mbappe of selling the entire squad for one young superstar at this mm. stage. So it's not as if they've gone out and had some sort of 
a huge spending spree that's resulted in a number of young, exciting players coming to the club. I think Barcelona, on paper, have had the better summer, to be honest with mm. you. I understand they've lost Messi, which is a huge, huge pull pull out of all of their numbers. But, you know, Depay is a good addition to Barcelona. Uh, Pedri is a year older. De Jong is a year more developed in, in that Ronald Koeman system. I think Barcelona are going to finish second this season, so I'm going to say over. No, Pedri's going to finish the season with no legs, though. Like Pedri, I know, mate. <laughs> he... 73 games he played last year. <laughs> Absolutely insane. I don't know what's going on with him. But, I mean, it, what I find strange, just to you know, digress for a minute, is that nobody's tested them with a little bid for De Jong or Pedri. I know. Can't believe that. Why is mm. that? I don't know, because I feel like they would be in probably especially Laporta after that press conference. I know that he's going to be desperate to keep the sort of untradeables, as he's called them, your De Jong, your Pedris. But if somebody came in with like a 70, 80 million euro bid, yes. that's like a game-changing fund for this mm. Barcelona wage system. Uh, and it would su- it surprised me that that hasn't happened. I think the only reason that hasn't happened is because nobody else across Europe's got any money. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. I don't think, they, I don't think any team's capable of, of, of doing that. So I think and he... United, United went out and did that with Real Madrid and Varane, and it would mm. require somebody else to go and do that who needs a defensive midfielder. And I guess like Chelsea, some people say they do, but overall they've spent their money on Lukaku. Man City don't really. I don't know. I feel Petri like I, De Jong. I feel like De Jong would be the perfect signing for Man City. Do you think? Yeah. Do you... But they're, but they're obviously going to. St- they're obviously more interested in signing Kane with that fund, aren't they? Yeah. No, I get that. But like, I just kind of look at them and I think. If you do have this money, and you obviously do, like De Jong is kind of an almost unmissable opportunity for Man City. Then you've got Rodri mm. and De Jong as your central <laughs> midfield options going forward. Otherwise, they're going to be in a position where they're starting Fernandinho. Fernandinho the other day, all he my was, Mora was onto him. <laughs> he was so bad, like as in. Yeah. Or, Actually, that that's kind of misleading. It wasn't so bad. He, he wasn't was so, he, he, when when he's he near was, the when he's near the ball, he's still really good. But what you hmm. see so often now with Fernandinho is he's not near the ball because he just can't keep up with play anymore. And like, it's hmm. not a criticism really because he is very old. Like, but I just thought I can't believe that Man City. I understand they want to get Grealish. I understand they want to get Kane. But I can't understand them going into another season with Rodri, Gundogan, and Fernandinho as their three central midfield options. I do not understand. That, but that was always going to be the case when they gave Fernandinho the new deal. I think they, they they decided they were going for other options when they gave him the one year contract extension because if they didn't if they wanted to go for the Fernandinho replacement they would have let him go in the same manner they let Sergio Aguero go, I think. Mm. I think and Silva. I think it's it's a really really weird squad building from Pep. Really. Yeah, but weird overall squad I, I I just to take it back to Barcelona, I, yeah, I think that I've, Memphis Depay covers maybe 50%, 60% of yeah. um, Messi's output, which is like, what, 20, 20 to 25 league goals this season? Or like 20 to 25 league goal involvements, I should say, sorry. Um, so I think they're going to be fine and finish second. So I'm going to go over the third space in La Liga. Ah, Sam, come on. See, this is, this is why it's mad, because I don't want to be the guy that's always going under here, yeah, but I think you're just underestimating how much of a loss... Messi is like fam. Did you not see the fans outside of the club in tears? Of like, course, that, bro. I know how that, big of a loss he is, but, like, but like, bro, the rest not of even, the league is also shot to bits. No, but I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. But at the same time, they finished third last year with Messi in the squad. Messi covered. He was responsible for forty six percent of their goals, and now they're relying on Braithwaite. Yeah. And a 30-year-old Griezmann. I think Griezmann's obviously going to get more freedom and, and probably play in a similar role to um, Messi when he was at Barca. But at the same time, can they depend on Griezmann to do that role? Obviously, Depay is coming in and he's he's hit the ground running in preseason and scored a few goals. But I don't know, man. The rest of their squad, they've still got Jordi Alba, 32 years old. He's still starting in that squad and he's not the greatest anymore. Like I think I agree, I agree, but they, they outscored the rest of La Liga by like 20 goals last season. Even if you take Messi's 20 goals out of that, that brings them down to sort of top goal scorer territory in La Liga. And that's without adding like a, a Memphis Depay in there. I agree if they can tighten the defence up, that that's a problem. But... Even then, it just brings them down towards like league average territory. By expected points, they were like 10, 12 points clear of the league last year, and they they obviously faltered because of like their finishing was turd 
for 90% mm. of the season. I also mm. think Atleti are not that good. Like, they won the league last season. I swear that was mostly because, like, Llorente managed to score and assist, like, 20 goals from about 4xG or something mental. Like, mm. everything he hit went in all season long. They ended up with a goal difference of plus 42. Their expected goal difference was plus 20. What is going on at that club? I mean, I guess it's I guess it's all black as well. But um, they only conceded mm. 25 goals. It's yeah, like... it's mental. Like, I just, I just look at them and I just think... Mm, I don't really see it. I look at Real Madrid and I think they'll probably be better just because nobody scored a goal last season except for Benzema. So that'll probably like help a little bit. But again, they're still like, oh, we're going to start Bale, who's 32. We're going to start Benzema, who's 33. We're going to start Modric when he's fit. He's 35. I just think they this didn't, is They grim. didn't look that bad, though. In their first league game, I watched some of the highlights here. They didn't look that bad. And I think... At, yeah, because um, they're Alibar still playing is... a terrible league, Sam. Like, it's, like, <laughs> it's just like... It's like just dropping like... I don't know, man. It's it's like me having a fight with like Conor McGregor or something. Like it's just like that is what it's like. Like these these teams come up from from the second division of Spain, and it's like Joe and Sonny and Templeman like going to play at the Bernabeu Relax and getting, now. Ab- Relax. getting absolutely destroyed. Like I just don't understand it. Like yes, they, they and they've lost Varane and Ramos this summer, so they're basically going yeah, to like Alaba and Militao as a back line. I still think that's okay, but it's not. It's not amazing or anything. And Alaba actually started but, at left back in the first game of the season. But you're forgetting the key the key thing at Madrid right now. And you lot are going to try and bore me. But Hazard's back. Not going to lie to you. He's had a very Dead. bad time at Madrid during his, t- during his time in Spain. Yeah. But I think he's genuinely... I saw a few interviews, um, him talking about his ankle injuries. And I think he's over it. From the assist that he gave Benzema um, in their first league game, he looks free again do you know what I mean and I think he doesn't have that much pressure that he had when he first signed for them and he's not the type of guy that deals with pressure that well as well so I think if he if he gets a few run of games ankles all right but um, Benzema's obviously gonna he's gonna score goals regardless if they can get a a, a, um, a good relationship going I think I think Real Madrid are probably my favorites to win the league Sam stop simping for a guy who left your club like no I love it's, him it's embarrassing I love him. It's embarrassing. Like, he's 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 old. He's he's rubbish now. Like I don't know. Uh, look, <laughs> but we're not saying like Barcelona have to finish above everybody. What I do think though is that for them to finish lower than third, a team like Sociedad or Sevilla have to really really get their shit together. Mm. And I think that's possible, but I'm not sure that it's likely. And even it, okay, obviously Messi the biggest loss there could possibly be in football. But you look at that Barcelona squad and you're not like my god how will this yeah, team yeah. do anything you still look at it and you think yeah this is, this is a pretty good squad <laughs> like like they'll still they'll still be a decent football club even if they're not like you know barcelona with messi good so like mm. i don't know man like i i i, I feel like th- there are big concerns like yes jordi alba starting still at this point and they've got rid of his backup they've sold him to leeds right junior firpo and they could yet lose a lot more of their depth. Like Puj could go, Moriba could go. I think they're trying to sell Longley, but can't find anyone to buy him. Like that, they're going to be fatigued over the season. But I still look at mm. them and I think, yeah, I think that broadly they're going to be fine. I do agree with Joe. I think they were the best side in Spain last year. And even if Ancelotti can improve Real Madrid, I think Barcelona, I'd still back them to finish in the top two. Yeah, I think I, I, I think yeah, un, under's a bit. Well. I think under's a bit tight. I, I'm sitting on the fence again. This is it's a third or second. Oh my minute. god! Oh my god! So under under pathetic, third, mate. under third is a, an extreme. Like there's not that many good teams in La Liga. Like come on, like I think third or second in it for for Barcelona. All right, well. We should have we should have given you some time before this podcast, Sam, to find your balls so that you could actually like <laughs> so that you could actually say Barcelona are going to finish fifth. Come on, we can't just all agree anyway. I've got to give you the points as to why they could potentially finish outside of the top three. You know what I mean? I'm I'm doing you. A I service. agree. I, I could I can see the path to Barcelona being rubbish. I can see the path to Barcelona finishing like fourth or fifth. I just don't think it's the likeliest outcome. That's what I'm saying. Mm. So, shall we so. shall we move back to the Premier League for this one then? Cuz I think yes. I wanted to talk a bit about the Premier League title race because I've been seeing a lot, especially after a very impressive win at the weekend for Man United, saying that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's team are potential title contenders. Now, I think that's maybe a bit generous because as much as I love yeah, Leeds definitely. and Bielsa, 
I do think that Leeds at home is perhaps one of the easiest games for a top club in the Premier League. <laughs> like, we, even we beat them like 4-2 at home. Especially or something like United season. at home, yeah. who love space in fast transitions, which Leeds, without Calvin Phillips, give you in abundance because they want to play 1v1. Okay, mm. so, my well, before we get into that then, let me just say that my over-under here, Man United to finish above Liverpool, which seems to be a very common prediction. A lot of people Ooh. are saying Liverpool fourth, Man okay. United third or second. Who wants to go first? Ooh. Uh, I, I'll say over. Let's, let, uh, I'll back it. I, I'm going to say over. I said over in my predictions and I'll stick by it, but I think it's going to be extremely close between those sides. I think it's nothing to separate them, really. Um, I do think that Man United are improving quickly under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and now actually have a real identity to their game, which is something that was lacking for a long, long time at Manchester United, especially under Lou Van Gaal and, and Jose Mourinho. Um, I think the attacking setup that ollie has got now rivals anyone in the league. I think that mm-hmm. Jadon Sancho, Rashford, um, Greenwood, Cavani, Bruno, Pogba, I think rivals anybody in terms of creativity, mm. output, mm. Um, ability to finish, movement off the ball, movement on the ball is really exciting. I think the defensive unit was actually one of Ollie's stronger points in terms of coaching. I definitely think he improved Manchester United's defensive setup. You can see that in the numbers um, over the last couple of years, especially Harry Maguire's consistency has been key. Luke Shaw's made huge strides under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in terms of um, just his all-round ability, to be quite frank. He's just a beast at the moment. If you go past him, it looks like he's in second gear to go back at you. I heard somebody say that he looks like he's playing football whistling the other day. It's 100% true. He looks like he's just jogging about and making everything look so easy. We do still have a huge issue in that defensive midfield pivot. Yeah. I think we need one lights out defensive midfielder. Let's say you drop Wilfred and Didi into that side. Then I think you've got a real shot of winning the Premier League title. United aren't going to do that. United are going to back Fred and McTominay because Oli loves those two um, against the big teams. And I think against the smaller sides, the sides that are going to sit deep with a real um, low block, you're going to probably see just one one pivot. And that's what Varane's going to allow United to do because we can push 10 yards further up the pitch without Lindelof's lack of speed. So United are going to make strides this season. But I think those strides are maybe limited at 85 to 90 points. I think Liverpool... <laughs> I think, I think Liverpool will be in a similar sort of territory, to be honest with you. With Andy Robertson missing the first six weeks of the season, I thought Simakas looked pretty good against Norwich, though it has to be said. I think Van Dijk will take a while to ease back into the side. Joel Matip never puts a foot wrong. I think they've lost one of 44 games that he started for Liverpool, which is bloody impressive. Um, but I just think that there's still question marks hanging over that Liverpool side. How quickly does Van Dijk come back? When's Robertson going to come back? That midfield three that we saw against Norwich probably isn't going to get you a, a league title. So Thiago needs to come back into the side pretty rapidly, doesn't he? Um, is the front three going to be able to perform of 2019-20 levels? Or are we going to see a continued drop-off from Roberto Firmino with Diogo Jota maybe adding in those extra goals? Sadio Mane can't perform like he did last season either. He needs to refine some of the form he showed in 1920. So I think there's a few question marks over the Liverpool side. But the squad mm. is so good that it's still going to be around the 90-point mark. I, I'm going to go like Man United, 87 points, Liverpool, 86 points, and then like Chelsea and City will be on like 95s, I think. Well, oh, I was about to say, like, when you said 85 to 90-point range, yeah. so you're predicting like the strongest top four in Premier League history this year. Yeah, I think I, I do think the top four is are significantly better than everybody else in the league. Like, a, Well, so do I. But like, even if the top four were all above 80 points, that would be like historically great. Like that just doesn't happen, man. Well, all right, let's drop it down to 80 to 85. (laughs) Even so, like I think you'll be about one to two point separation between the two sides. Okay. Okay. Sam, do you have any, any riposte to that? I think it's tight, man. I think it's, I agree with Joe in terms of how close the points are going to be this year. I think the top four teams are clearly... Better, better than the rest, and I think from the first the, the first game that we saw from Liverpool, I think they Van Dijk was such a big miss last year, and we saw how bad their defense missed him, and him coming back and them having Kanate and Matip back from from injury, Joe Gomez, the the depth in their defense as well, um, Simiskas he he had a good 
he had a good um, game against Norwich, even though mm. he got burnt a few times by, by Aaron's. But mm. I'll, I'll just put that down to getting used to the league. But I think they look a lot more assured with Van Dijk in the squad. And he didn't really get tested. And obviously, he's going to get tested a lot this season. But a big problem that they had last season is that they, they, the way they play, they basically got burnt out. And you know the way, um, how close the seasons were and they didn't have that much of a pre-season. Everyone was saying Liverpool style of play is basically the reason why they struggled this season. And I think them having a full pre-season, Mane came out and said that him having a full pre-season was so good for him. Um, Jota having a full pre-season. And I think if they can get up and running and and kind of... Because I still don't know how they're gonna how they're gonna fully set up. I don't know if M- Matip and Van Dijk are gonna play every game together. Obviously, Joe Gomez is back. Konate, he's definitely gonna play a few games, and they're gonna they're playing in every competition. But I think they've got such better squad depth, and they were only five points behind United last year. So with those additions to the squad, and Mane maybe back on form, Firmino scored in his first game, Salah just doing a madness as usual. I think it will be very very tight. I'd, it's I don't, oh. I don't know. I I want to say I think Liverpool have kind of gone under the radar because they haven't made that many signings. So obviously United have made signings Sancho, Varane. You saw how excited everyone was after their game against Leeds. But I think that, like Joe said, that game is perfect for United. It's it's yeah. a perfect showcase game for United mm-hmm. to just flex their muscles and do a madness. And to be fair, the the next few games for United are actually quite calm. Like they they should win their next few games. So if they can get a, um, a run of wins and Liverpool they, I think they've got a few um, games a few I can't remember I think they're playing a few teams in the top 10 so they're gonna their games are going to be a bit, bit more difficult than United so it depends on who has a better run of games I think at the beginning of the season and then maybe halfway through when they start playing each other it's just going to be interesting like those United versus Liverpool this year is going to be a madness like Liverpool versus Chelsea Chelsea versus United I think those games are going to really tell who finishes where interesting so you think well I suppose if everybody is finishing above 80 points it is going to come down to like those really fine margins yeah, right it, but, yeah. I think it will but, as well but, but I agree with Sam. My, my, my slight to, to, to bring a note of caution into like the kind of positivity about Man United, I will say that last season they had about 60 XG and they scored mm. 73 goals. So they could improve their underlying attacking performance by quite a lot, but not really improve their actual performance, if that makes sense. Mm. You know, if that comes mm. back down to earth, that finishing. I do think guys like, I think Greenwood is a plus finisher. I think that Bruno is a plus finisher. So I'd expect them to slightly overperform expected goals. But overperforming by 13 is a lot. Um, I yeah. also think that despite that terrible season, like you say, Liverpool within five points of them had better un- underlying numbers than them. And I do think they've got better depth, um, especially in midfield and up front, like having Jota there, like that is, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. I don't mm. think Mane will be as bad this season. For me, no, I'm a bit concerned about because I think he's had three seasons now of underperforming his numbers. So that's like a bit of a warning sign. But I also think you're right that Liverpool... It's been 18 months now of this extremely, like, tiring COVID schedule. And they've been the Euros. And Liverpool's style is much more wearing than Man United's. Like, it always sounds like a criticism when I say this, but I feel like Man United are quite an old-fashioned side. Like, they don't press as intensely as some of the other sides in the league. They're much happier to, like, counter. Um, But that, I think, is sensible when you know that you're facing compressed seasons and also when you've got the talent that they have. So... I don't know, man. I find this a really difficult one. I, I'm, incl- so I'm inclined to back Liverpool. I'm inclined to back Liverpool because I do think that, like, I think Varane's a world-class centre-back, but I don't think he's as good as Van Dijk. I think Sancho's a world-class attacker, but I think he'll probably take a little bit of time to bed in. Um, and I think that Liverpool still just have an excellent team there that kind of got done by a bit of bad luck, mostly last season. Mm. 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 So I don't know. I, yeah. I think I take the under on this. You're going under, yeah, I'll stick with over. It's, 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 it, man, it's going to be so tight to call the top of the league. But then, like, there's always one team that fucks it and falls out. But, like, we've all thought it's going to be, like, a nailed-on top four of this season. So, like, mm. I don't know which of the sides it's going to be, but it could easily be one of these two. Yeah. Uh, I just don't see a world in which that Chelsea side and that City side, with the depth they've got, like, 
underperform massively whereas y- you never know do you it always feels like Leicester worm their way in somehow but then they don't but then they end up not like managing like, yeah. I don't know I, I do see where you're coming from I think somebody will like have a slightly disappointing campaign in that top four but I think that because they those four teams are such a step ahead of the rest of the league I think that United or City or whatever could afford to like get unlucky and lose 10 points and I still think they'll finish above Leicester, Arsenal and Spurs who are the next best teams in the league. Like, I mm. I just don't see any of those sides seriously troubling them. Spurs have a great squad. I think Spurs... I don't know why people doubt, have been down on Spurs' squad in the past. They keep hold of Kane, especially. But um, I still don't see them as anywhere near these sides, right? Yeah, no. Nah. I think they, they had a lot more to do um, this window and they just haven't really... It's, it's similar to Arsenal, to be fair. They've been they've been linked with so many players. They were linked with, I think, uh, Paul Torres. They were linked with him. The club said yes, but Torres was like, "Nah, I'm not trying to play for Spurs." And they've, <laughs> Can they've they had, two point yeah, like they've had that. They've had that quite a lot this season. So I think with the squad that they have, it's I think it's it's better than than Arsenal and Leicester are always in the conversation. But I think Leicester are so so used to being like just being outside of the top four. So I think they, they're they probably going to see themselves favourites to finish in fifth. And I think it's for, for for Spurs and Arsenal, they're sixth and seventh. And yeah, man, even... even Actually, no, let me not say that because no, Everton no, are... They're, they're, they're doing that. <laughs> no, I was going to say Everton, but then... Nah, Ooh. nah. Ooh. nah. Everton are going to be effective under Rafa Benitez. Though. I think I they'll be think better though. Yeah, I think, under Rafa I think Benitez, they'll be good. But finish mid-table still. Yeah, I just think they're too thin to really challenge those sides. Like that that's my that's my issue with them. Like what, and Richarlison, Richarlison has had a similar situation to Pedri, right? Like the guy just has played every minute. Mm. What do you think about Villa though? Do you think that they can cuz obviously the signings that they've had, I think they've had the best transfer window outside of the top, let's say 6, even 4. Even to be with fair. losing Grealish. Yeah. And I don't particularly yeah, but... like the Ings move as much as I like Danny Ings. I don't think it's that sensible in the long term. Re- really? I think that that's a good option because Watkins was that striker last year that he he got into such good positions, but he wasn't scoring as many as he could have. But he's so, I think so good, in, Sam. Yeah, no, nah, he is good. I, I like him. Like, but I think Danny Ings is that striker that you give him a few chances, he's going to bag. But you you're know paying, what I mean? but you are paying like what is it like basically thirty mil for a relatively old, relatively injury prone player. Like I I love I love Danny Ings, and if he stays fit, great. But like. I personally wouldn't have done it. Like Watkins, I think is Watkins has got signs of being a really, really amazing striker. I think. Like I think Buendia mm. and and uh, and Bailey are both fantastic signings. But then, like uh, I don't know, it was fifty fifty on their business when there were rumours they were offering twenty five mil for James Ward Prowse. I was like, I would definitely not do that. Like. Well, I don't know, man. I still think they need some more depth in defensive midfield. To be honest with you, I'd have spent money on that over Ings. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. think they definitely need another DM. But I, I, I don't hate Villa's business. I don't love love it either. I think that they'll be comfortable in that mid-table zone, though. I think yeah. they're very very much a settled Premier League side now, and it might take them a little bit of time to adapt, Bailey in particular, because um, we've seen Buendia be able to put up those chances in the Premier League before. So I think like Danny Ings is going to score 10, 15 goals probably, yeah. and that's what they've bought him for. Um, and it might be a slight overpayment, but they've just risked that to stay like to guarantee league survival, which Danny Ings absolutely does. I think, I think, I think this might be a matchup. I think they can push for the European Conference League spots in it. Oh yeah, I they, think can. They, they can. They can. They yeah, can they can that. definitely. They can. They definitely can. Yeah, yeah. For but sure. I wouldn't back them to finish above Arsenal, Leicester, Spurs. Mm. Like, um, I think they're in around sort of Leeds, West Ham, Everton, aren't they? Like, yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe, may I think maybe Brighton might sneak up into towards those sort of zones as well. If me too, if the forwards start hitting the back of the net. Me too. Um, just to touch on something, like because Sam, you talking about Spurs squad has reminded me that I kind of I missed this while I was on paternity leave, and I would actually like to ask your opinions on it because there have been rumours that Man City have tried to sweeten the deal for Harry Kane by offering Laporte and Gabriel Jesus at different points. I was wondering if there's any combination of money and those players which would tempt you like would you would you consider it if they were like here's like Laporte and Jesus would you would you consider that for Kane I think I think I would man I think Spurs need to really think about life after Kane and I think they're just not thinking about it enough like obviously Mm. 
from when he did that interview with Gary Neville, we all saw um, what he said about him wanting to move on, even put a price on on himself. And I think that a oh, 120 mil with a player like Gabi Jesus or Laporte or even both, I think that's I think that's probably one of the best deals that's you could get. That's nuts. 120 mil not, plus Gabi Jesus and Laporte. On. You're in dreamland. No, they're not going to do that. On. I'm assuming one, that they'll okay. give you like, if they give you Gabi Jesus, I assume they're going to give you like 50 mil. No, come on, Pat. Have a day off. It's 120 plus a player like Gabby Jesus, surely. Yeah, but that's not bad. Plus Gabby Jesus. Uh, then that's a no-brainer. I definitely do that. But that's what I'm saying. I don't even think Levy looks at that and thinks, yeah, why not? Like I think he just, he's so hell-bent on keeping Kane and obviously he signed that long-term contract. But at the same time, if, it, I don't know. I I think 120 I've been mil such, and I've a player such like is... A, I've been such a person that has been like, You've got to keep Kane. If you can keep Kane, you've got to keep Kane. But it is now getting to the stage... It's toxic, man. It's going to get toxic. Not even so much that. It is now getting to the stage where it's almost like you didn't win anything with Kane. Mm. You could have £120 million in the bank, plus a player, potentially. Uh, Let's say it is Gabby Jesus, who I don't think is realistic because I don't think he would want to take the step backwards to Tottenham Hotspur. Um, And you weren't winning stuff with Kane. You get £120 in the bank... And you've got a striker through the door, and you can reinvest that across the board squad. Like you were finishing, at, you were finishing like seventh with Kane. Mm. Like, what's the worst that can possibly happen in this situation now is that you dropped tenth, which obviously is a fullback. But then you can reinvest that money next summer. Like, I think it is now getting to the stage where 120, 150 million pounds you've you've actually just got to consider. Just, just yeah, just do it, man. It, it, it's it's just becoming a. Sh- First. I guess my concern though would be like whether there's somebody out there you can go and get so for instance if the Lautaro Martinez thing was like just waiting there and it was like we sell Kane and we turn around like half of that money on Lautaro I genuinely think that's a no-brainer I think yeah. that's I think that's such an easy decision Lautaro is actually quite like a young Harry Kane like I think mm. he's one of the best young strikers in the world like that would have mm. made perfect sense and you'd still have money to go and get another centre-back or something else um, but the problem is Lautaro looks like he doesn't want to go Tammy Abraham's already gone Alexander Isak has already signed a new long-term contract I agree Gabby Jesus probably doesn't want to go to Spurs so if you do sell Kane for that money who are you going and getting that's my one thing because I mean again if you say to me oh well you can turn it around and get and get Calvert-Lewin or something again maybe mm. I consider it but I truly don't know who Spurs can get if they sell Kane at this point in the window, that's my only issue. Yeah, Doogie suge- I heard Doogie suggest Dominic Calvert Lewin on um, Sky Sports yesterday, and I thought it's an interesting shout. It is. Yeah, I never thought about that. Does Calvert Lewin move from Everton to Spurs? Like, not a sideways step, but it's like a, it's like I don't know, like a fifteen it, it, degree step, isn't it? It, I mean? it is a, is a little step up. Like, it, it is a step it up. Is, like, let's is. be honest, and 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 I think. It will definitely be good for the type of squad that they have, because they, because I was think I was more thinking, okay, cool. If they can't get a striker, maybe Sun goes in the middle, and then they they possibly get an, another a wide another a wide man. But then I was thinking, who could they even get as well that that would make sense for the Spurs squad? So it's I think they've left it really late. Like they they should have been speaking to Kane as soon as he came back from from the Euros been having conversations with him and and yeah we've heard things about this gentleman agreement and stuff like that but like really and truly okay cool how much will it cost for me to to leave I don't know I don't really know how many conversations that they've like have City actually put a offer down that have been, that this has been rejected it's, it's not Spurs's fault is it like Spurs obviously want to keep the player and City mm. haven't bid enough so yeah. it's not their fault it's now running late in the window if City come in on deadline day of 170 million pounds then accept it do you know mm. what I mean like it's it is what it is at that stage because you just can't. I just can't see how you turn down money like that in this current market. Well, if you can't spend like, it though, it's a, like so. For instance, if you sell Kane for that this year, you have that money for next year. And I agree that like it doesn't really cost Spurs anything. Like they're not going to like lose out on Champions League football because they've lost Kane. They're not going to get Champions League football anyway. But if you get it this summer and you can only spend it next summer the money's going to be worth less next year as like clubs rebound from their financial crises. Whereas selling him at the beginning of the window 
and then you're one of the richest so clubs sense. in Europe, like that yeah. would have actually been like a pretty good situation. But everybody then knows that and runs you up, don't well, they? Well, sure, but sure, but like there's only rich. so much they can run you up if they're desperate for cash. Like, to sell, yeah. They could have gone and got like, you know, an hour and a striker. Like I think if you if you'd got in on Martinez before Lukaku had gone, then you'd have had an interesting shot. And as much mm. as he says he doesn't want to go to Spurs, Spurs can offer him a big salary bump on what he gets at Inter. I mean, even mm. even there might be outside the box options. Like, I don't know. If, the, if this would be the case but maybe maybe like Chelsea could be tempted into a Timo Werner sale or something like for significant money like I don't really know but mm. it might be worth at least exploring those options right they've got mm. other problems as well though Tottenham like this and Ndombele situation is really starting to bubble away I think mm. obviously being left out of that match day squad against Manchester City he's not favoured by what I've read by Nuno he seems to be quite homesick upset at the fact that Aurea and Sissoko are leaving the club or the uh, potentially leaving the club and I would be slightly worried about that he's one of Spurs' top earners he's on 200 grand a week he's got to be up there amongst their record signings right in terms of immediate fees mm. I think that if they can't like deal with that situation this summer you're losing a significant amount of money for a player that should be one of your key members of yeah. the team. Like I think Ndombele situation needs to be resolved quickly. Yeah, well at least at least it looks like they'll rehabilitate Deli Alley, which I'm really glad about. Like it looks like yeah. the w- admitted it is against Man City and people have different game plans against Man City than they do in all their general games. But the role that Ali had, which was just like getting from box to box, basically making no, runs. He looks, is he looks really good. It's perfect yeah. for him. It's perfect for him. Mm. And I think we all maintain that like Deli Ali is probably one of the most talented like English midfielders around. There should be a role for him in this Spurs side. Mm, yeah, definitely. He did definitely. get sent back to MK Dons at one stage by Riyad Mahrez. In that <laughs> yeah, but that happens. That happens, doesn't it? <laughs> I've had one more thing though. One more yeah. thing because me and Joe were talking about this um, the other day. Yeah, and this 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 is just about Chelsea and obviously the signing that we made with Lukaku. I put yeah. That Lukaku oh coming God, back. Me out. I thought Lukaku coming back is a redemption tour, yeah? Because obviously when he came to the Premier League the first time as a Chelsea player, things didn't work out. Obviously worked out at Everton and West Ham. He's Brom, got nothing then, to prove, but bro. Then, Lukaku but has then, got nothing to but prove. But then when he went to United, that was a big move again. They, he wanted to win titles, wanted to win the league. Didn't work out. Went to Syria. Obviously we saw what happened there. Now he's coming back. He's coming back to the Premier League to basically be the star man, to win the league with Chelsea, yeah? Can you not see why I have said that it is a oh redemption tour? I just want your answer, Pat. No, it's a redemption tour for Chelsea. That is exactly <laughs> what I said, Pat. Those, are the, Pat. those are the exact words I used. No joke, I said it's a redemption tour for Chelsea because yeah. you sold him. You f***ed him off for nothing. But it's 28 still... million re- pounds, Sam, and now you're paying, now you're paying 100 mil... For a guy, ninety-three to be exact. It's an an admission. It's an admission that you got it wrong. That is what it is, Sam. There's no other way around it. You you sold. You had him. You sold him. You then had the option to get him again, and you didn't. Like and now you're United. And also, actually, if you factor in the money you spent on, say, Morata, if you factor in the money that you spent on like other strikers in an attempt to fill this hole, this is probably mm. one of the costliest mistakes in football history. And now he's no, coming back. And I'm, I'm no, delighted for him. Like that. he obviously loves the club. Like I wish only. I, obviously, Preach. obviously, I hate Chelsea. They're scum. But like, I wish only <laughs> good things for Lukaku. I think he's Same. impossible not to like. Um, one of the most intelligent, likable footballers who also happens to be a world-class striker. Great. But Chelsea should have welcomed him back with a formal apology for all the ways that they fucked him over. No, that, I I'm truly not, you know believe what, that. You, you know why I'm not hearing that? Because it's, it's, it's kind of similar to the Tammy situation, but not as bad because Tammy obviously got his opportunity in the Premier League, yeah? But at the time he was here, bro, we had Drogba that was still doing bits. He was 35. He had, I think he, he, he had his opportunity in the Super Cup. Fair enough, I think Jose actually came out and said it, it wasn't a mistake, but that game kind of pushed him out in a sense, yeah? Now he's coming back. He's coming back to the team that he loves. Coming back to the team that he supports. He w- w- he said that he needs to play oh there. Sam, you Sam, telling me Sam, that this he was is... Such Sam, he was oh an elite gosh. scorer in the Premier League for West Brom 
And then at Everton, Everton, when he was a kid, are you serious? What are you talking about? Like, no, but it's why not are you trying to paint your it's not Sam? Just accept that your club is in the wrong and Lukaku is in the right. It's that simple. Chelsea no, got it wrong. It, Lukaku didn't fail Chelsea. Chelsea failed him. That is how it worked. We 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 were always gonna reunite. It was always a part of the story. No, it wasn't. United checked. It was oh United. God. United checked us originally because he was supposed to come back, and then Pogba was in his ear and told him, you know, oh you'll enjoy God. up here in Manchester. But it's not as bad as you're saying it, and I think that. It's a redemption tour, isn't it? That's what. That's oh, what so, I'm Sam, are you, would you would you say that Paul Pogba is on a redemption tour at United now? Then it's not the same, though. I told you it's not the same. Well, United sold United sold him for pittance, absolutely fucked it, and had to buy him back for ninety million pounds. After but yeah, no, but, no, but to be to be fair, it is it is kind of a redemption tour because he he felt he he didn't work out here the first time he came to the Premier League. Yeah, for United, I'm not what talking are you about saying? Lukaku he was a being kid. Like Everton. Oh my god. But it's still, but that's why I said it's different because Lukaku was was older. He was a bit older. He had a few um, games for he Chelsea. He scored 113 goals in the league. Yes, this but is... not for a top, not for Chelsea. Oh, not my. for Chelsea. What do you mean, not for this Chelsea? Is so mad. Like I, I don't understand this man. This is like saying if 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 it were a different club, this is so bizarre. If it were a different club, if it were like Arsenal, who'd done this, who'd who'd like if Arsenal had gone out this summer and bought back like Nabry for like a hundred mil. Like, I don't think that you'd be saying, oh, it's the player, it's the player, it's a redemption tour for him. I think you'd be saying this is just evidence that Arsenal are a badly run club. But because it's Chelsea, no, you're like, it's... no, no, no. Nah. We it, we did, we made the right decision getting rid of him at the time because we're Chelsea, we only make correct decisions. No, no, no. It was Okay, let me, this is my final point. It wasn't the right decision selling him. We should have put a buyback like we've done for Tammy. We didn't do that. We tried to sell, sign him again when he went to United. It didn't work out. We've signed him now. It didn't, it didn't work out for him at United. And my thing is, it didn't work out for him in the Premier League where he was at two top clubs. So now he's coming back to the Premier League for a top club where the objectives are always to win the Premier League, the Champions League and all the other trophies. It's different to saying, oh yeah, he scored a bag of goals for Everton and West Brom. Yeah, that was he's a different... He just won the Scudetto yeah, exactly. yeah, two months that, ago. The Serie A just been is the best different player to in the Italy. Premier League. The Serie A is different to the Premier League. Yeah, that's dope. why I say it's Not a redemption. Really. For, okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry, so you're saying that Chelsea's Chelsea's standards last season, like, okay, you, man, you managed to win the Champions League, like, because Tuchel came in and, like, said, I don't know what Frank Lampard's done here. Like, we could just, like, play some good players and actually win something. Uh, we could defend for half a season. That would work. Like, but you were not remotely in the title chase last season. Inter mm. ended like what is it nine years of Juve winning the Scudetto, but the standards are different. The standards are different at Chelsea. Come but on, man. It, come, uh, okay, okay. I'm not gonna argue it anymore. I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying. Joe knows what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. But I hear, I hear your side in it. If it's, it depends on how you look at it. But I think it's a redemption tour for him coming back to Chelsea. And I'm he gonna has keep on nothing, to prove. nothing to he prove. He is such a good player. He has How, absolutely nothing to prove. Of course, he's anyway. he's a he's a fantastic world class striker. But his story at Chelsea was not that. So that's why I'm saying no. It's a the story tour. at Chelsea was that like you have a situation where managers know that if they don't win immediately, they're going to lose their jobs, and therefore you constantly you lose young talent for below market rate. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't his fault. He wasn't given the opportunity. That's not his fault. He immediately went to West Brom and absolutely destroyed it. He was so good at West Brom. Like, and this is... Oh my God. This is when you were like playing like Drogba, <laughs> Torres, uh, Eto up front. All of those were f- rubbish at that stage. Like... <laughs> And you weren't playing Lukaku. You could have had Lukaku having paid like a pittance for him. You could have had him for his entire prime. Instead, you're buying him at 28 years old for 100 mil after dicking around, like Euros. giving minutes to like Giroud over the last few years. I mean, it's embarrassing, don't, Sam. Don't, Just don't accept do your embarrassment. Just accept your embarrassment. Just deal with it. Accept your club was Sam, wrong. Sam, you brought up this point as well. You brought up the point. No, the because, no, because I, just want, I just wanted to see what Pat would say. And I, I thought that, you know, your paternity leave would have brought you around a little bit but no you're still the same it's fine it's I, fine look it's i am fine. i am always 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 on lukaku's side always on lukaku's side and in this instance so on this one. i don't see how anyone can not be except for you the the ultimate like chelsea like full kick here in the end holding up a sign about how <laughs> lampard's a traitor because he went to man city for a season <laughs> that's you 
<laughs> Sam would have been one of the guys in there calling it Eden Hazard a rat when Jose <laughs> no, Mourinho was no, not happy. <laughs> no, no, no. So you, yeah. you lot are twisting the story. You lot are twisting the story. We're not doing this no more. We're not doing this. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I mean, we've got we've gone over an hour. Sam has said something stupid, so I feel like we've covered all our bases. Um, thank you very much for joining me today, guys. Is there anything you'd like to plug before we say goodbye? Joe, do you want to start off? Um, yeah, why not come over and watch Snapchat? Uh, Transfer Talk is a Snapchat show that chats about transfers every single day. So come and subscribe to that. Cool. Sam, you must have something to plug. Come on. Uh, new something coming soon. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> new something coming soon. On... Really? That's banging. Oh, what a, li- what a no, because the SEO on I that. I don't, wow. know, I don't know how I'm supposed to say it. Just a new show coming soon. Yeah, watch out for that. and it's you're Yeah, definitely it. go out after this and Google new something, Sam Abasaki, and see what you get. I'm trying uh, to be discreet. <laughs> All right, all right. Well, thanks very much for watching, everybody. Thanks to you guys for joining me. Obviously, let us know what you think of our opinions in the comments below, and we will catch you next time. Bye. Peace. Bye.